Chris Brown, Steve Tasker with you on a uh, pretty seismic day in terms of roster turnover. It's been pretty significant through the course of the offseason as the Bills have uh, bid adieu to several veterans on their roster, many in, in, in large part to being cap casualties to save money on the cap as they were strained up against the cap. Uh, this one takes on a little bit of a different tenor, knowing that the Bills had to take on more cap responsibility by trading Stephon Diggs. And this, uh, the terms of this trade now official from the Bills. They have agreed to terms on this trade of Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans. And to talk about it with us, our good friend, senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, joining us on the line. And uh, we were going to talk draft, Greg, but look at what happened here. We, we've got a much different mm -hmm. uh, set of circumstances to talk about. But I, I guess at first blush, Greg, to see a team like the Bills, who were cap-strained, make this move uh, and take on an additional $3 million in cap responsibility, um, what does it say to you? Well, a couple of things. Uh, number one, it tells you that they were anxious to make the trade and get rid of Stefan Diggs. I'm not in the building. I can't speak to the why. Um, and... Number two, it also tells you that there was not a big market for him because obviously this trade didn't just come about in five minutes. I'm sure there have been numerous conversations over probably a meaningful amount of time and there was just not a big market. Now, again, I hope fans are interested in tape reality versus emotion because the tape reality tells you that Stefan Diggs is not a number one receiver in the league. He might have been on the Bills, but he's not a number one receiver the way we think about number one receivers, the guys who really are. Um, and he's 30 years old. So you're talking about a 30-year-old declining player who's not a number one. That's essentially what's to, what the tape tells you that Stephon Diggs is. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of raw emotion right now for Buffalo fans because it just happened, but that's the reality of the tape. Well, let's dig into that a little bit more, Greg. So what do you see on tape that shows you a quote-unquote declining player from at least being an alpha male number one on a roster? I don't think he's a fully dimensional receiver at this point in his career. Um, he's not a true vertical dimension. Now, that doesn't mean you can never catch a vertical ball. I want people to understand that. You know, there's a lot of guys in the league who you wouldn't call vertical receivers who do catch, you know, go balls or posts. Um, but he's not a, a fully dimensional receiver at this point in his career. He's, he's much more of a, uh, for want of a better term, a possession type receiver at this point in his career. Now, he's still very, very good at that. That's his game. Um, and I think that's ultimately what he is. And, you know, you have to remember, he's going to a team where he's not going to be the number one receiver. So, uh, you know, he helps that team a lot because they have Nico Collins, who is a true boundary X number one receiver. And on the Bills, Stephon Diggs, just by dint of elimination, was their number one. But I think they're looking to, to ideally get a true number one. Now we'll see what happens in the draft. And we'll yep. see if they have something in mind with a trade or whatever they feel. We won't know the answer to that, certainly not in the next 24 or 48 hours. But, uh, but I think they just felt that he's 30 years old, he's declining, um, and, you know, let's, let's move on. Let's, it, it's time to move on from Diggs. One of the things we've discussed as well is with a guy like Diggs, he's certainly not going to fall off a cliff. I mean, his production and his targets were there yeah. even when he wasn't being as productive in the second half of last year as he was in the first half. But th this deal, like you said, there's a couple of things about it. One, it smacks of mo letting Diggs move on a year earlier than rather than a year late. Yes. And two, um, the – the month, the financial stuff is also notwithstanding. The money's already been paid to Diggs. That's on that are on that's on the cap. It's not like they're going to throw any more any more money to him. Uh, and it would be hard for him to live up to the contract that he was already had already signed. Yeah, and and he's probably at this point in his career. I think he's he'll be thirty one during the season. Uh, it'd be unlikely that he's going to get another big money deal at this point in his career. I mean, he, he you know. The, look, we know that Houston is a team that probably is going to have a good passing game. So 
I don't know if he's he's probably not going to get the same volume of targets he got with the Bills, although that that declined clearly as the season progressed. But so he's not going to put up the same kinds of numbers. And I don't think that the league would see him. Clearly, they don't. Or we, we saw what the trade was. The league clearly doesn't see him that way. He's not going to get another big number deal. So, Greg, let's look at the draft. We've talked to you about this already. I know we did at the Combine last month about how it is a deep receiver class. A lot of people point, you know, to the top three in the class, namely Adunze, Harrison, and Neighbors, as true alpha dog, number one wide receivers right out of the chute. Would you put any other receivers in this class in that category, if not instantaneously in their rookie year in the NFL, players who could uh, mature into that kind of role? In this class, I think to me, there's two others, but I think your point's really well taken because if they were to get either one, I don't want fans to think that those guys are automatically, you know, Justin Jefferson, you know. But I think that the uh, the other LSU receiver, Brian Thomas, could become that guy, and I think the other Texas receiver, um, A.D. Mitchell, could become that guy as well. Um, but I, my guess is I think Thomas might be a little more advanced right now than Mitchell. Um, I really liked Mitchell's tape, but yeah. uh, I think there there are some concerns. But Thomas would probably be just slightly ahead of him in the ability maybe to make the transition quicker. Uh, but I think either one of those guys have the traits, the skill set. They're, they're big. They can run. Um, they both can work the middle of the field. They're vertical dimensions. Um, I think both those guys have multi-dimensional skill sets. All right, so that and that's what we thought about too. Because when you talk about the Diggs trade, this whole thing smacks of finger quotes. Another shoe's going to drop. I mean, there's another step in this because at 28, it has to yeah. right? Yeah. So You're right, Steve, and that's why people, you know you have to be careful now about you know the, the, look fans. I understand it. You know, I grew up a fan and I remember going to games and my team lost and I'd cry. You know, I mean, fans are fans, you know, that's the way it works. But, you know, there's a lot more to happen with this and we'll have to wait and see. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering why. Well, why didn't they get more for digs? Well, you're trying to get as much as you can, but the league tells you what he's worth. You know, that's Steve, you know that. Brown, you guys know that the league tells you what guys are worth. They didn't go into this deal saying, oh, let's let's not get a lot. You know, they're trying to get as much as they can. But the league informs you of what a player is worth. Um, So let's see what's going to happen. You know, in a sense, signing Curtis Samuel, in some ways, they just signed Stephon Diggs. He's the same player. So they replaced Diggs with Samuel, a younger player, hopefully can stay healthy, um, probably a little more explosive than Diggs right now. So now they need that other dimension. They need, you know, somebody who gives you that that intermediate to deep and vertical dimension that can really, you know, stretch defenses. Now, at the very least, if there is going to be, or if there is a, and there is a plan, but whatever that plan may be, the Bills, if they're going to, like, if they stay at 28 and they don't, they can't find a way to move up or whatever, whatever that means, or, or if they're willing to stay at 28, that means at least there is multiple players that they have targeted at maybe right at wide receiver right that can be that because they know they know some one of these say what two or three guys is going to be there at 28 we don't care which one of these three it is and you mentioned ad mitchell brian thomas jr okay brian thomas jr probably won't be there at 28 maybe he will is there a third guy is there like an xavier leggett or somebody like that that is there that would also go into that group um, well, then I, then I think you have to decide how you feel about someone like Xavier Worthy, um, who obviously can run. I mean, we didn't need his four two one forty time at the combine to tell us he can run. You just had to watch the tape. Um, but he's a little more than that. Um, he is a tough physical kid. I mean, he's just 165 pounds, but he's not just a guy who just runs and that's it. Now, the way the league is, and, and you know, Joe Brady, I think, understands this, and he used motion, and he used different formations. Obviously, with receivers like this, um, 
you have to be able to move them around. You have to be able to put them in motion. You have to be able to get them free access. You have to be able to exploit and take advantage of, of their speed, get them off the line cleanly so they can pressure the, the secondary vertically right off the bat. Obviously, you're not lining this guy up at boundary X and expecting him to, you know, hand fight bigger corners. Um, so I don't know how you feel about someone like that. I mean, keep in mind, receivers are getting smaller now some are really big we have it, it, it's become like a, either they're really big or they become smaller you know it's it that's the way it's become you know last year you had someone like jordan addison 173 pounds tank dell 155 or 160 pounds it all depends steve as you know in, in the the deployment of these players how do you deploy them within the context of your offense greg i know you probably are aware of a lot of what i'm about to lay out for you um since you do watch the tape every week but since Joe Brady took over as OC in week 11, in seven of the last nine games, counting the two playoff games, either Kincaid, Shakir, or Cook were one of the top two in target share in the passing game behind Diggs. And in seven of those nine games, two of those, top, two of those guys were in top three in target share. There yep. almost seemed to be somewhat of a more democratic approach to the distribution of the ball in the scope of Buffalo's offense with Brady at the controls, I'm not going to pretend that that was a factor in, in the decision to move on from Diggs, but uh, do you think it at least gave the Bills brass, the coaching staff, a little more comfort that they have multiple answers in the passing game if they have to subtract Diggs from the equation? I think that's without question, Brownie. Don't forget, as soon as the season ended, you know what coaches do. They watch all the tape from the previous season before they even get to free agency and the draft. They watch every play from the previous season. And what you just said about the, the target share, and I didn't know the exact numbers, but it was evident on tape um, uh, that, you know, I, I imagine with Kincaid, they've got bigger plans for him. Shakir has shown, and by the way, Shakir, when he was at Boise State, played both in the slot and outside. Shakir is not a little guy. I mean, he's not big, and you may not call him physical, but it's not like he's 170 pounds. He's about 195. He can line up all over the formation. Um, so I think the sense is that they don't need to have, quote-unquote, specific roles for players. Like, they don't need one boundary X, and we're going to line up this guy at boundary X all the time. That's our guy. Or one guy's just going to be in the slot. I think they see it just as you said, Brownie. And I, I'm sure that was part of the impetus for what they're doing, what they just did, obviously, because they see their pass game as being, you know, much more diverse formationally. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what we're waiting to see. Um, what their change in plans are. Joe Brady with an offseason. There's so much that we don't know about what's going on in the coaches' offices, about their conversations. And I've said this time and time again over the last two weeks. We don't know the opinions that the Bills coaching staff has about their own players, let Correct. alone let alone about the players that they don't have yet. So that, is, to me, is the, is the one bit of information about this Diggs trade that we don't know. How good do they feel about Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, Dalton Kincaid, Dalton Kincaid, and James Cook? You know, I mean, how good yeah. do they feel about those guys? I mean, I know Cook had some tough drops this past year, but Cook is a very good receiver. And, you know, you'd have to assume that that's more aberration than the way he is because he was a really good receiver in college. So, you know, look, we'll see what happens there. Do they have a lot of draft capital? I mean, if the draft were to play out a certain way, can they move up? Do they have capital? Not not really. Um, they pick at 28 and 60 in rounds one and two. They do not have a third after they got jobbed by the league on not getting a compensatory third for the Edmonds loss. They only got a four for that, and they just parted with a five. Long story short, eight of their ten remaining picks are on day three. Okay. Because, you know, you're starting – look, you never know how the draft's going to go. And it's easy to sit here and, you know, that's the fun of the draft is, you know, people do these mocks and people make up trades. You know, that, that that's the fun of it. But, you know, you never know how a draft is going to play out because what's going to happen with all this quarterback talk is you're going to have receivers start to drop. And when I say drop, I don't mean they're going to drop, you know, 
uh, neighbors, uh, Harrison and June say they're not going to drop to 20 or anything like that. But I didn't know if they had enough capital that if all of a sudden one of those guys was there at 12 or 13, you know, could they go get him? I don't know the answer to that. And they might not even be thinking like that. Right. And it, it would, you know, it's going to be mega expensive to move up into the top 10 of the draft to get right. a guy that. I don't that, think they can do that. Right. That's a, that would be a plug and play player. But how many players do you think, Greg, are there at that receiver position? And we've, we've been dancing around this all the entire segment. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze are plug and play. Um, some more so than others, you know, but, but I would say that's absolutely the case. I would say, depending on your scheme and how you use him, I would say Lad McConkey is a plug and play player. He's just not a, you, you wouldn't call him explosive in the way you'd call the other guys explosive, but McConkey is really fun to watch. I mean, this guy's an absolutely terrific route runner. He gets open. Um, he, he knows how to get corners off their spot. He knows how to get corners turned. You know, depending, like, like if I plug Lad McConkey right now, right into the Rams offense with all their reduced cut splits and all their motions, you know, McConkey would, you know, I'm not saying he'd catch 104 balls like Nakua, but, you know, don't forget Nakua was, was just a guy coming out of college. I mean, it's easy now, you know, there's a lot of people now that say, well, gee, I love Nakua, you know, that stuff's easy after the fact. Um, but, uh, you know, McConkey is one of those kinds of guys that if used, in, in a certain kind of way could easily be a factor year one. We kind of tend to think, Greg, that not only must the Bills get a receiver high in the draft, they're probably going to have to get an additional one uh, yeah. somewhere in the draft as well. Do you think two is the minimum they have to come out of this draft class with? I think they have to have two out of this class because the way they see it right now, I'm sure – uh, you know, without knowing all, all their meetings and, and, you know, behind closed doors is um, Samuel and Shakir are clearly going to be two of their top three. Um, and Kincaid, I'm sure they see him in a, in a much more advanced role this season. Um, now, again, we're not going to sit here and say he's Travis Kelsey, but I, I'm sure they see him in a far more advanced role than he was as a rookie when he's still learning the league. So, you know, they see him, I guarantee, as more than just a quote-unquote tight end. Yeah. One last thing. We've been, uh, you know, we've been had our ear to the ground, you know, for a while. And now, uh, just today, Lad McConkey was on with Kay Adams and said that he's met with the Bills multiple times uh, in pre-draft uh, meetings. Yeah, well, he's, he's really uh, – Steve – you know, if you were to get to see this guy like in detail, you'd love him. I mean, this oh, guy knows I've seen how to him. run routes. I mean, the, he's just the guy gets he's open. One of those guys, he shakes guys off. Um, he, yeah, he drops guys off. That's you know, that's kind of receiver lingo where you go out, you run around, and you drop the DB here, and you're over there. You know, you just drop the guy right, off. Right. He does that constantly. Yep, and and while he's not a vertical threat, he's a little faster. I mean for whatever it's worth and you know you can people can take 40 times for whatever they mean but he ran a 439 which was pretty impressive i mean i i thought he'd run well but i didn't think he'd run a 439 yeah i didn't either i didn't either yeah he's i'm telling you i was the guy runs routes I watch like a lot of georgia business. games he gets open outside mm -hmm. inside he's just crafty yeah oh, and I, he knows i mean he knows how to use his vertical stem to get corners moved all right, how and he give us a range. Of the top give, of his route stem. give us a draft range. What you know, how high could he go? How low could he go? Um, well, that's a great, you know, again, because he's not truly explosive, um, you, you know, then it becomes, I think, team and scheme specific, like depending on, on how you play offense. Like if you're a big motion team, if you use a lot of reduced splits, um, if, you, if that's the, the way you play offense, he's your guy. Um, you know, if you're just going to line up guys static on the outside, outside the numbers, you, you may not see him the same way, Steve. But, you know, there's more and more motion now in the league. There's more and more diversity with formations. There's more and more reduced splits. I mean, he kind of fits the way the league is going right now. That's kind of what I see, too. I think the guy is a, an NFL kind of receiver where he can line up and shift formation. He can shift. He yep. can motion. He can line up tight. He can. Yeah. Um, and I, because once you, once you start doing that, 
it becomes a much more mental game as a wide receiver because you not only you're lined up here and that you have to be aware of where the defense adjusts, how it adjusts while you're moving and as the ball is being snapped. So you have to change your mind as the ball is snapped. And that's hard yeah. for a lot of guys to do because it's a mental exercise. He strikes me as a guy who has done that at Georgia and done it very well. Yeah, no, I, I just really loved watching his tape. And, uh, and I think, like I said, you know, he's not going to be a top 15, but he's, he could go higher than people think. I mean, he's, right. his tape's good. And, uh, you know, for whatever it means too. another uh, measurable, he had a 4.04 20 yard shuttle. That is ridiculously off the charts. Yeah. That is a super low number. You do anything under four, two, you're elite in that category. Uh, Greg, thanks as always. We appreciate it. We promise next time we'll talk more about some draft prospects, although we did hit on some receivers again this time. So no, thanks well, again. To. I mean, big day, big day in Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll catch up with thanks, you, Greg. Greg. Thanks. Thanks, guys.